Okay, I want to start by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to describe our work. Um, so, as with many labs, one of our main goals, overall goals, is to better understand how when you have an individual disease symptoms and you treat with a drug, how is it that the, alleviated, the symptoms become alleviated? And by having a better understanding of how this works at the cellular level, uh, we hope to be able to predict then what are drugs that are both efficacious and safe. So our approach evolves the budding yeast because um, the barcoded deletion strain collections in, uh, allow us to uh, perform in vivo chemogenomic profiling. So briefly, what that entails is uh, treating each deletion strain with a compound and then measuring the resulting growth fitness, and uh, which can be either improved, reduced, or about the same. And uh, we note that if a strain grows differently in the treated versus untreated sample, then the deleted gene is important for the cellular response to the small molecule. And because uh, we have these deletion strain collections, uh, we can test all the non-essential genes uh, with homozygous deletion strains and all the essential genes with heterozygous deletion strains. So together, we, have a, um, we can interrogate the whole genome for, um, to get a portrait of the cellular response to small molecules in vivo. So for example, um, we look at the anti-cancer drug 5 fluorouracil so quickly, it disrupts DNA and uh, DNA synthesis, and um, thereby triggering cell death. So here, along the x-axis, you see uh, different deleted genes, and along the y-axis, you see um, the corresponding fitness defect score for each strain. And uh, so, a higher score indicates that the strain grows worse or doesn't grow as well as the. Uh, untreated sample. And we note that those with the highest scores um, involve, there are genes that are involve RNA processing. And um, this observation suggests that the drug is also incorporated into RNA, and there's evidence of this in human cell lines. So uh, this example just underscores that it's useful to have a genome-wide interrogation, because you can recognize um, or you can get a more complete picture of the mechanism of action of a uh, small molecule. Okay, so what we did is uh, we profiled a large, relatively large collection of compounds that are structurally diverse but um, drug-like. And this resulted in uh, this data matrix where we have over 3,000 chemogenomic profiles and each profile contains a fitness defect score for each deleted gene. And so you see here that we um, hierarchically clustered these uh, profiles and then applied a dynamic branch cutting method to identify discrete um, clusters towards identifying classes of cellular response. From this, we computed a median profile, which is just as it sounds. You uh, for each gene, we compute the median fitness defect score and then focus on those genes that um, have uh, significantly positive scores in this median profile, and we call this set of genes a response signature. Um, if we do a little bit of uh, functional analysis of these, uh, for example, this signature, we see that it's um, significantly enriched for uh, genes involved with DNA repair, so we call this specific signature um, DNA damage. Now, we um, identified 60 major response signatures that are shown in this network. Each blue node is the response signature. And uh, we connect it to chemical moiety nodes, the, the white ones, if uh, the compounds that induce that signature are enriched for, the, um, spe for specific chemical moieties. For example, um, I can't point it out exactly there, but uh, the uracil transport signature is linked to um, the uracil chemical moiety as expected. So uh, in total, there are 32 signatures that are linked to um, specific chemical moiety, so that's around half. 
Now, if we take a closer look again at the DNA damage signature, we see that the compounds that induce this signature are actually enriched for um, compounds that are known to, uh, like their mechanisms are known to involve DNA damage. And in fact, for 26% uh, of our signatures, we observe something similar where the associated compounds are of similar bioactivity. So what this implies is that we can use a guilt by signature association approach to infer the mechanisms of uncharacterized small molecules. For example, uh, for NQO is known to be in, um, this, its mechanism is known to involve DNA damage, and this other compound beside it is uncharacterized. But uh, this, the heat map there shows that the genes that are signif have significant, significant fitness defect scores for in both of their profiles, and these uh, genes include some of the rad genes that we saw in the DNA damage signature. So we uh, infer that because they both induce the DNA damage signature that the uncharacterized compound also uh, has a mechanism related to DNA damage. And on top of that, both of these uh, structures have nit uh, nitro groups as shown in green. So uh, we also consider thinking of, again, these response signatures are actually gene sets, and we were wondering if we could find these gene sets in other genomic data sets. So here we focus on genes that have ne negative genetic interactors, but their genetic interactors are not enriched for any go process function complexes, et cetera. So um, those are the diamond nodes. And then what we observed is that they are, in fact, enriched for specific signatures. So the blue notes again. So if uh, a set of negative genetic interactions is enriched for a signature, there's an edge connecting the two. And so what this suggests is that maybe these signatures can also be used to help characterize other um, genomic profiles in addition to applying your traditional like functional analysis methods. So as an example, uh, the yellow diamonds are uncharacterized genes and one of them um, is YPL109C, which is localized to the mitochondria, but otherwise we don't know what it does. And here we see that it is linked to the um, cytochrome C oxidase uh, response signature, providing a bit more information about what it might, um, what the function of that gene is. Now, we also looked at, uh, when we focus on pro the profiles associated with a specific signature, we can check uh, whether genes are correlated across these profiles, um, meaning, and we call this that they have, um, sorry, we say that these gene pairs are cofit gene pairs. Now, we ask if one of the genes is in one process and the other is in a different process. <laughs> So if we look at this example, the ubiqu ubiquinone biosynthesis and proteasome signature, each node represents a GO biologic process that is enriched in the signature, but the edges are indicative of uh, co-fit genes. So um, thicker edges are uh, related to uh, relationships between processes that are supported by multiple co-fit gene pairs, and then the dotted lines are uh, correspond to support from one highly co at least one highly cofit gene pair. So in red, I highlight um, the namesake for this signature, the relationship suggested between prote the proteasome and ubiquinome biosynthesis. And it turns out that this relationship is also supported by nine genetic interactions and also one physical interactions, which kind of highlights the uh, complementary nature of our um, genomic data set to other interactome data sets. We also, uh, I also highlight this um, signature, the neo one pick one signature, and um, here the relationship between diphthamide biosynthesis and histone exchange in red appears to be novel, but um, it also, uh, since it's novel, it might be the case that this relationship is conditional on perturbations that induce the neo one or pick one response. So. Now if we take a closer look at these uh, NEO1-based signatures, where NEO1 is an amino phospholipid flipase, we find that they're characterized by uh, NEO1 haploinsufficiency, 
Um, these are some of the compounds that induce the signature. And, and those with the green square are uh, cationic amphiphilic drugs. And we find that this set of compounds are uh, significantly enriched for um, CADs for short. Now, we also know that CADs are linked to drug-induced phospholipidosis, uh, phospho uh, sorry, a lipid storage disorder. And it, this disorder arises from the accumulation of CADs in acidic vacuoles and in yeast and in the lysosome for mammalian cells. So here we're wondering if uh, neo one half of insufficiency could be a phenotype that can act as a proxy for the drug-induced phospholipidosis phenotype. And to uh, investigate that, we looked at the growth of the neo one uh, heterozygous solution strain. And uh, here the black curve is just the vehicle mock treatment curve and the gold curve is uh, tamoxifen, which is a uh, compound that induces the neo one signature and it's also a CAD. And we see that it has, uh, it exhibits neo one half of insufficiency as expected. But when we also treat with bifilomycin A, which is an inhibitor of the uh, yeast vacuolar proton ATPase and therefore disrupts um, vacuolar acidification in yeast, we find that um, the addition of bifil bifilomycin A rescues the neo one half low insufficiency phenotype. And this is in line with um, neo one half low insufficiency as a uh, kind of proxy for the DIPL phenotype. So in addition to doing that, we built a model using uh, structural features of our known neo one compounds to predict uh, unknown, like pre compounds that are not known to be associated with neo one And while this model performs um, better than random at predicting those compounds, we also show in this plot here that it also predicts better than random at predicting compounds that cause DIPL so based on structure alone. So this kind of reiterates the link between uh, NEO1 and the storage disorder. So in summary, uh, we were able to use our chemogenomic data set to identify um, several signatures of cellular response. And these signatures can be used to, uh, for several different applications that I uh, will just go over quickly. Uh, one, to infer mechanisms of uncharacterized compounds. Two, to con characterize other genomic profiles, which uh, in my example allowed potential characterization of genes as well. And then to uh, the signatures allow the identification of relationships between processes, some that might be conditional. And uh, we also identify relationships between structural features and cellular responses. While, um, and lastly, the NEO1 example uh, identifies a relationship between a gene and a specific side effect, the DIPL, which suggests that perhaps the human orthologs of this, of NEO1 can be used as a biomarker for the disorder because uh, currently there's no clinical tests for it. So uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, Guru Guyver and Corey Nuslow, who are now at UBC, uh, Rob St. Ange at Stanford, who helps, uh, who led the screening efforts, Ian Wallace helped with computational analysis, and Gary Bader, who helped guide the computational analysis. And thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. We have time for a question. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you've considered bi-clustering uh, some of these matrices to get some of the conditionality out of there. Yeah, we did that. Um, it seems like a more direct way, right? But uh, so w we did see some uh, overlap between the clusters that we I identified by the method I showed here. But uh, what the reason why I present this one is because we kind of wanted to stick with the hierarchical structure because some of the known chemical, I mean, not known, but existing chemical ontologies are hierarchical in nature, so it would be good to compare at some point. Yeah. Great. Thanks. With that, I'd like to thank all the speakers of this session.